crazy fun game here as Creighton survives against Oregon in double overtime. 86-73 was the final, but yeah, it's a double overtime game, so a 13-point win is a little misleading. Uh, some superstar performances all over the court in this one. Let's start with the two Ducks. Nafali Dante, 28 points and 20 rebounds. Insane. Cousinard, 32 points. Took him 33 shots to get there. Uh, like, wow. I Watching the game, it felt like Cousinard was dominating. Not really in hindsight. I mean, I, that was crazy how many shots he had to take to get Oregon over the hump here. How how did Oregon hang in this game? I thought this was a great matchup for Creighton and didn't expect much from the Ducks. Um, the refs let him play. <laughs> the refs let him play, and and it and it allowed Oregon to use their strength and their size and their athleticism, I think, to a greater degree than they would have been able to if the refs called all the fouls. Um. I liked the game. I liked the way it was played. I liked the way it was called. I think it was called fairly. And I think that the refs were consistent from tip to finish with how they were calling the games, the game, but it did. It it helped Oregon and it especially helped Oregon when Creighton was missing jumpers because it forced Creighton to try to get the ball inside uh, where Oregon was there and Oregon was physical. Um, and that's also partially why it took Kuznard 33 shots to get to those 32 points was, I mean, he was six of 12 from three. Uh, it, it was the, the interior looks he was getting the, the attacking the rim, trying to fight through contact, trying to go at Ryan Kalkbrenner. Um, those were the shots he was missing. Uh, right after, um, or right, you know, a day after Zach Eady put up his, 20 rebound what was it 30 points or whatever he had in his game uh and folly dante 28 points 20 rebounds yeah um Kalk Brenner almost i mean he had 19 points 14 so like he was also gathering all the boards the starters on both teams played a ton uh and the the only downside to this game from a non-betting perspective was that the second overtime was just where the the wheels fell off for Oregon. They ran out of gas. Um, if you had Creighton minus the points, which I said I would have taken in the preview, uh, you loved that second overtime. Yeah. But uh, outside of that, I think, you know, I tweeted this, nothing's a bigger buzzkill than a game that was as competitive as this game, as back and forth uh, as this game was being so uncompetitive in the final overtime. Um, yeah. But it, it was just, and it was weird how the first two, the first regulation in overtime ended because it's like mirror images of each other, right? You, in the first one, you had uh, Creighton made the clutch shot with a few seconds left, and Oregon had an okay look, uh, just not enough time, and it didn't fall. Uh, and in this, in the first overtime, Oregon made the clutch three uh, with like seven seconds left, and Creighton got an okay look uh not a great look but an okay look and it didn't fall um it's just it was it was just a really good game and and i'm still coming down from the excitement that was had in the first 45 minutes of it yeah yeah sometimes there's a game that happens in this tournament that just reminds us like at our heart we we love this sport Right. That's why we set out on this stupid project to do previews and recaps for every game. It's why I have a podcast. It's why you work in this business. It's why you write. It's why you guys have your heat check shows. Like it, it, we, we love this. We love this sport and we can love players. We can love storylines. We can have our teams, whatever. At the end of the day, like it, there's something just thrilling about a good game in the NCAA tournament. And that's what this was. Um, who knew that the best pod or the best uh uh site in <laughs> it today would be a 14 against an 11 and an 11 against a three yeah i mean that's i would say this pod goes down as an all-timer from uh just uh, an excitement standpoint it's hard to say two games back to back had more thrill juice than uh nc state oakland and then this game um going through it from a creighton side you had four threes from Shireman, four threes from Alexander, five threes from Ashworth. A lot of these were big, man. Like they they were down six with I think six minutes left in the game in regulation, and 
kind of had this feel of like, oh, no, they've gone cold. Oregon's not going to stop scoring here. And no, like Ashworth had some huge threes. Shireman had some really big plays late. Alexander Clutch, too. Like uh, those three, Carter keeps calling them plus four with Calk. Like it's it's the best foursome in the country when they're going like this. And I think that's a, an accurate portrayal of it. The problem for me is I, they're so limited outside of those four. And Mason Miller can have good games. He was just 0 for 3 tonight. But like, I don't trust their bench at all. They really need like 40 minutes from those four every single night to win against the best teams in the country. Yeah. And you talk about clutch threes. Like, Carl Brenner took one and made one. And it was probably the most important three of the game, perhaps for Creighton, which uh, again, they were up by three. It pushed them out to a six point lead in that double overtime. But I think when Carl Brenner made that shot, you kind of knew that the game was over. Like that was the point where you knew, okay, Creighton's going to win this game and they're going to win this game relatively comfortably considering everything that's happened before now. Um, But I agree with you. Look, they were shooting like 27, 28% with like 10 minutes left in this game. Um, They finished the game at 38%, which is a really good, maybe not by Creighton standards, but it's a, it's a really good uh, three point percentage. Uh, They couldn't get anything inside. Um, Kalkbrenner shot well, but outside of that and Folly Dante was just a menace uh, on the interior. Um, And I, I think I agree with you that especially in this next game against Tennessee, where it's another physical team, it's a team that has more guys than Oregon does that can put up points and that can attack you. Um, the defense for Tennessee has is always elite. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a really tough test for Creighton and not one that I'm comfortable with if i'm a creighton fan yeah yeah that's gonna be a fun game we'll do a preview of it later this week but uh i think there's a lot to think about with that game and wouldn't be surprised either way like if creighton ends up bombing threes wins i won't be surprised if tennessee holds them to 37 points i won't be shocked like it's gonna be a really compelling matchup um i do want to go through some of the the sequences that uh at the end of regulation overtime here that stood out to me um look i think creighton if you play at Oregon seven times, I think Creighton wins in five or six max. Uh, and you saw that as this game extended, right? Go to 45 minutes, now go to 50 minutes. The longer this went, I think it, it benefited the better team here. Um, mm-hmm. With that said, hard not to say Oregon should have won this game with, with where they were at down the final four minutes. I mean, they just really needed a couple big shots late, just take care of the ball. Uh, the biggest sequence to me at regulation, they're they're up two with 27 seconds left or whatever it was, and you inbound to Nafali Dante in the bonus. Yeah, that <laughs> sent him to the that can't happen in that spot, right? No, I mean if if I'm if I'm Dana Altman at that point in the game, you know they're gonna foul. Why is he on the floor? Right. You can sub. Like it, you don't trust them to make the front end, but you trust in Folly Dante too. Like that's it's it, it was a it was a weird game. I think in in this game and in the Tennessee game at the end of regulation, uh, you saw some some coaching decisions that I think Dana Altman and Rodney Terry, but Dana Altman will look back at the end of that regulation and and uh, and he'll have some notes for himself about you know. I know coaches don't always play what ifs and should haves and could haves, but there were some big should haves and could haves at the end of, of regulation. You can also talk about how slow it seemed like Oregon got into a set uh, on that final possession uh, on the missed, on the missed uh, shot uh, by Kuznard at the end of regulation. And maybe they could have had an additional second or two uh, on, on their offensive half of the floor to really get maybe a little bit of a bit of a better look or get the ball to Dante. Um, It it just, it contributed to a great game. Uh, Both teams played well. I feel like both teams played well on both ends of the floor, which is odd to say, like 
both teams played well defensively, but they also were making really good shots, really tough shots. Um, and you just kind of knew the longer this game, like you said, you knew the longer this game went that Oregon's the, the two players that could score for Oregon in that second half were just going to, going to basically die on the floor yeah. uh, for lack of a better word. Yeah. It was a heroic effort from those two. It really was. And, Dante has been incredible down the stretch of the season. Five Ken Palm MVPs in their last seven games during this run where they won the Pac-12 tournament. Uh, tonight, he played 48 minutes. I mean, that's so absurd for, for a big man, especially having to deal with Kalkbrenner the whole game. Like, 48 minutes, 28 points, 20 rebounds, three assists, two blocks. Like, I just – I was so impressed with how much he had in the tank in this game. And uh, he'll always have a fan in me, honestly, because I've watched enough Oregon where – I'm familiar with this game. I've never seen a performance like that from him, even in this run. So really impressed from, from my end and uh, Creighton. Ultimately, I think a lot of brackets would have been hurting tonight. I know a lot of people pick this team to emerge at least the elite eight in this region and um, still breathing. Uh, we said it with Tennessee. Well, I just did this with Ralph a couple minutes ago. Tennessee survived their stinker. And that should scare everybody left in the tournament. And I, I don't think this was a stinker from Creighton, but I think they dodged a bullet. And if you're mm -hmm. dodging a bullet in March, that normally bodes well, because not a lot of teams do that. Sometimes one bullet's all it takes to send you home. So new life for the Creighton Blue Jays and Greg McDermott. And, uh, and, and I think it's also beneficial that for both teams, for both Tennessee and Creighton, that they played on the same day. Um, yep. You have a full 48 hour or 24 hours. I guess you have a full 24 hours where you don't have to kind of prep for two different scenarios. Yeah. Um, and, and in the, in the world of, of scouting and, and game planning, 24 hours is an eternity. So I, I think from that perspective, both of these teams should be pretty well set up, come in with pretty good game plans for each other, uh, which should lead to a, a really good game. I mean, considering that Detroit, I mean, regardless of who wins tomorrow, Detroit probably is going to have one of the better slates uh, for the Sweet 16. <laughs> um, and uh, just one last thing. I mean, this this Oregon loss, uh, I know they kept it close, but I think it continues the trend we've seen of, of freshmen, uh, especially freshman guards, but freshmen just kind of shrinking in March. Mm -hmm. um, Shellstad was three of 10 from the field. He had four rebounds, zero assists. Uh, Kwame Evans was an offer with just five rebounds. Um, and if you got just a little bit more from either one of those players, I think Oregon's winning in regulation. Yeah. And you did it. So, uh, you know, something that you put in your notes and send to John Calipari uh, <laughs> and let him deal with it. Yeah, bitter pill to swallow. In the end, I think, uh, look, it's always hard to lose in March. I think Oregon fans, a couple days removed, will be able to live with this result. I mean, you get a Pac-12 tournament championship, uh, win a game in March, and look, you had Creighton on the ropes. That's an impressive, impressive final two weeks of the season. Creighton fans, had they lost this game, I think would be kicking themselves for quite a long time. So I think uh, in the end, no, it doesn't feel like it right now, Oregon fans. Everybody gets a, a slight win over these last two weeks. A slight win. That's what I'm going to go with. Um, and I think, I mean, Oregon's played well. I think for a non-Oregon or a non-Tennessee fan's perspective, for next week, I think Creighton was the team that people should have been rooting for to yeah. win this game. Uh, I know we love upsets, but uh, I think Tennessee would have just eaten Oregon alive. Yeah. And uh, at least with Creighton, Creighton throws a little bit of a wrench and a little bit of a mismatch at Tennessee that I don't think Oregon would have provided. Yeah. So that's 100% accurate. And uh, after last season, as much as I loved watching the sixth place ACC Miami Hurricanes in the final four, uh, I'm kind of enjoying that the best teams are playing well in March this year. 
That should make for a fun next couple of weeks. That's Connor Hope. He checks CBB. I'm Greg Waddell. We are presented by our friends at uh, MyBookie. MyBookie presenting sponsor of all things on the Sleepers channel in the month of March. We have a special offer for you. You can get a deposit match bonus up to $1,000 as a first-time user. Use promo code SLEEPERS. There's a link in the description of this video. MyBookie's awesome. They got player props, futures, odds, boosts, expert picks. Whatever you're looking for, if you're trying to bet some money, you should bet with us at MyBookie. They'll take care of you. Uh, go check out that link in the description. Promo code SLEEPERS. Thanks to Connor. Congrats. Creighton fans, we'll have a preview up of your Sweet 16 game later this week.